prayers. I was saying <coughs> to George back there just before baptism, I said, you know, George, if, um, if I die in surgery, um, you have the high, high honor of being the last person I ever baptized. He didn't seem overly impressed. I thought it was impressive. Um, yeah. um, I don't think there's a, 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 a person, no matter how, how macho they are, um, that, that can't say that they've come across some uh, love story that hasn't uh, caught the, their heart and their minds. And you know, it's, it's interesting, when you, when you think about love stories, there, there are thousands and thousands of them written in books and, and movies, um, stories told. Um, and when you look at them, they, they kind of share the same little recipe. Yeah, you have two people who, who deep down inside feel like they have something missing that, that they don't feel complete and all of a sudden they, they, by some odd circumstance, come into the paths of one another. And, you know, like in every good movie, uh, there's always an obstacle, uh, whether it's uh, hostility that, that they find themselves in, or intimidation, or, or just fear of inadequacies. And, and then something happens, and it pulls them together, and they connect with one another, and they live happily ever after. Um, if you look at just about every love story, even though they can be all sorts of different details and spins, they seem to follow the same formula. And, and there are other love stories, of course, you know, uh, man and his faithful dog and women and cats, I, I don't know. Um, uh, but some, um, you know, or, or, or you know, you know the, the, the friend stories of, you know, two close friends that, you know, it's a different kind of brotherly love. And they're great stories. And they're stories that, that, that fill uh, the human heart and inspire the human mind um, to make us believe that there's something wonderful out there. Um, one of the love stories that you never really hear about or you never really put it that way is, a, is the kind of story that Jesus begins when he says, love your enemies. Love your enemies. It, that doesn't sound like a love story. This morning, we're going to continue on uh, the second message uh, that we started a series on last week called, What Did You Mean By That? Particularly, God, what did you mean by that? <laughs> last week, we looked at Psalm 5, verse 5, where we read of God, you hate all who do wrong. And at first glance, you say, yeah, that, that's right. But then you say, well, wait a minute, that's me. How can God love us, but then hate us? And what we said was that, that God hates sin, and yeah, he even hates the this, this sinners engaged in sin, and yet his love is always out there, ready to be poured out upon those who just simply repent, who just simply recognize that I'm a sinner and, and I need God, and his love is there to wrap around them. Um, we said as kind of the, the guiding principle of that is when, you, when you're not sure what God means, just understand that God isn't mean. That when it comes to understanding, when we see those things that we say, God, what do, we, what do you mean by that? We always have to have that premise that if I don't understand what God means, I've got to hold back and remember God isn't mean. And the rest of it will come as I dig. Well, uh, this morning... It's kind of the same thing, except a little bit in reverse, because we're going to look at what it means when Jesus says, love your enemies. 
because I don't think there's a Christian in the world that doesn't open up their Bible, look at that one, and just kind of, ugh, you know? It just doesn't settle right. We're going to look um, at a passage, Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says it a number of times, but we're going to look in Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to put that up front, um, and look at what it, God means when he says, love your enemies. Now, this is interesting. Look what we read. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, <clears throat> Jesus begins by quoting a saying, a saying that they had all heard, a saying that, that they grew up with. Uh, sayings are those observations that are made in life um, that, that give us a sense of instruction of what to do or what not to do. Um, measure twice, cut once. Don taught me that saying. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, it's always said after you've cut and screwed it up, you know? Well, you know, measure it twice, cut once. Thank you. I'll remember that next time, even though we don't. Or, um, you know, which parents tell, you know, breaking up is hard to do. It's even worse if you're the one being broken up with. Um, when life gives you lemons... Now, the problem with that is, what if you hate lemonade, too? <laughs> uh, no one ever thinks about it. But it's just one of those sayings. Or birds of a feather flock together. Your parents, you heard them say, you know, if you're going to hang around them, you're going to be like them, and, and, it, and people are going to know you by the people you hang around with. That's what was going on. The Jews had a saying. Um, and it's a saying that... that began, so everyone thought, in scripture. But it was a scripture that was twisted. The scripture was Leviticus 19. And if you can just flash it up there real quick. Leviticus 19, we read this in the Old Testament. God speaking uh, to the people of Israel. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself, period. Now, what the Jews did is they said, well, okay, who's my neighbor? Well, it's, it goes back to do not hold a grudge against anyone among your people. So my neighbor is my fellow Jew. And my fellow Jew, they're my friend. They're my friend because they have to be. Because we are surrounded by enemies who want to take us out at all times. And so even if, if you, know, you weren't overly friendly with another Jew, you were friends enough because you knew you had plenty of enemies who were looking to wipe you out. Um, you know, the friend... Uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, even though they might not necessarily be my friend. Well, that's what was going on. The Jews just said, well, if love your neighbor means love a fellow Jew, love someone that's good to you, then they just, they added a little part to it. And they said, love your neighbor as yourself and hate your enemy. Now, that makes logical sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you're left with love your neighbor, love your friends, well, it, it seems reasonable you could tack on, if I'm supposed to love my friends, what do I do with my enemies? I hate them. And it, it just feels kind of good, too. And when you think about it, it's reasonable. I mean, think about the the idea of love your enemies? Anyone who goes around loving their enemies sounds unhealthy, don't they? Like, what are you doing? Why are you allowing yourself to just to be 
walked on and treated horribly. I mean, that, that's unhealthy. It's unstable. I mean, how stable can a person be if they're running up and embracing the person who's, who's punching them in the eye? Um, it's unwise. Wise people don't just pursue people who don't want to be pursued by them, people who hate them. It, it's, it's unproductive. I mean, it doesn't seem to get you much in this world to love your enemies. And so it makes sense. And in fact, when you think of the word enemy, what do you think? What do you feel? When you think of enemy, you feel fear, don't you? You feel pain or hurt that could come. You feel oppression that they're trying to stop you and get in your way. You feel betrayal. And so it makes sense. I understand why the Jews would say, look, we'll just tag on this other little phrase. It'll be our little saying, you know, inspired by God. Love your neighbor. Hate your enemies. And so we go back and we read what Jesus says. He said, I tell you, Love your enemies. Now, that's all well and good, but what about God? Did God love his enemies? In fact, if you, if you go back to, um, I believe it's Joshua chapter 9, or chapter 6, you see God telling the people of Israel to wipe out the Canaanites to go in and take the land and from the youngest to the oldest to wipe them out and to make sure not one of them is left standing. Well, how can that same God who tells them to go do that be the same God in the New Testament that Jesus represents when he says, love your enemies? The answer to that one isn't too difficult. One, God knew what they didn't know. God knew that they were a people that didn't just hate Israel. They hated the God of Israel. They wanted to wipe out everything decent so nothing decent could flourish. And they wanted to wipe out the people of God that God had ordained to be a blessing to them and to the rest of the world. And yet he knew He knew their hearts that all they wanted to do was to destroy them. Um, The knowledge that God has is a knowledge that we don't have. We don't get to make that call. Um, Because God, when he does something like that, doesn't do it based on emotion like you and I do. God doesn't do it based on hurt feelings. When, When God takes care of an enemy, it's not because God is hurt, not because God is angry because uh, they've messed up. It's because he understands that they will hurt others that he loves, even while he loves them and waits for the repentance. In fact, it was over 400 years before God did anything to the Canaanites. He suffered all of their pagan rituals and all of their sick sexual um, uh, practices. So when we say, well, what about God? God doesn't seem to love his enemies. No, he loves them. But God gets to make that call. We don't. Because think about it. If God is good and God is right and he creates his creation... Only he has the call to determine what to do with that creation. We don't. So when God says to us, love our enemies, it's not even in the same ballpark. Now, now here's the thing. Here's the problem. I'm to love my enemies because deep down in, at the core of it, 
it comes from a big problem. And the problem is this. My biggest enemy is in me. My biggest enemy is in me. Jesus tells us uh, to love our enemies because he understands we have to. Because just to begin with, our biggest enemy is in us, our sin. And that distorts everything. We can't even make a righteous call because our sin distorts it all. God can make calls like that because God doesn't sin and God is righteous and he's merciful and he's long-suffering. We're not. Wait 400 years for an enemy to change their mind? We won't wait five minutes. God tells us to love our enemies because we need to understand that my biggest enemy is in me. It's my sin. And it just, it lays havoc to my relationships. God understands something about us. And he wants us to understand something about us. That not every enemy is my enemy. I mean, think about that. Think about the people that you have called your enemies. And maybe later found out they weren't your enemies. Maybe just because you read in bad motives and bad intentions. Maybe it was because of the way they look that you just said, don't like them. I know this will be shocking to you. I've had people who have not liked me the minute they looked at me. No, don't like them. I hate them. Because they read something into me. And I've done it to others, and you've done it to others. God understands sometimes what I don't understand, that my enemy is not always my enemy. He understands that I'm not right on all the issues. Maybe I make you my enemy because I say, well, you believe that, and that's wrong, and I don't stand for that, so you must be against me, so I'm against. And yet the truth is, maybe they're not wrong. Maybe it's me who's wrong. Maybe it's me who's just wrong in my heart. Maybe sometimes my enemies very well could be my friends and maybe my friends could really be my enemies and so God says love your enemies because not every enemy you have is an enemy and not every enemy you have is God's enemy because when God sees us bickering and fighting amongst ourselves and being unloving He just sees a bunch of sinners going at it and not trying to love each other as he's loved us. Your enemy doesn't mean that your enemy is is God's enemy. That's why Jesus says your sin inside of you that's bigger than anything else, you can't make those calls. Not, any, not every enemy has to stay our enemies. And with God's help, I can make my enemies my friends and his friends. You see, the biggest enemy inside of me is me. The biggest enemy outside of me is me. Because I can look and I can make enemies I mean, think about the enemies that you have, and yet some of them are good friends with your friends. How do you figure that one? If your friends are good people that you love, and they also love the people that you hate, who's right? That's why Jesus said, love your enemies for two important reasons. One, 
so that I can see what I don't see. That by loving my enemy, I get an opportunity to see what I never saw before. Two, so I have to see what I don't want to see. There are all sorts of people we have prejudices against. And we don't want to see what we don't want to see. Even within the Christian community. I mean, there was a time 50 years ago, Baptists and Presbyterians didn't talk. Baptists and Catholics definitely didn't talk. Charismatics and Baptists, they wouldn't even have anything to do with each other. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Never mind race and, and sex and uh, economic positions and all this garbage. Loving my enemies helps me to see what I don't see, helps me to see what I don't want to see. Loving my enemies helps me to become dependent upon God in what he sees. You see, when I love my enemies, and even if they don't like me, and even if they're hostile to me, what does it do? It forces me to God, doesn't it? Because where else can I go? It forces me to God. It forces me to the body of Christ to help me, to support me in the love of Christ. It forces me to become dependent upon him. And it forces me to be used like I never would be used if I didn't love my enemies. Number two, the purpose of it is to make friends of my enemies and to make friends of God's enemies for God's kingdom. How in the world can we reach the world if we're only looking to reach our friends. God wants us to be bigger than that. He wants the love of Christ to be wider and deeper inside of us. See, when you hate your enemies, it only reveals what's going on inside of you. It's only with your enemies that you get to see the garbage inside of you, the darkness. I've said it before. How I treat my enemies will also determine how I treat my friends. Because when my friends tick me off and I go off on them and I hurt them, it's because I've had plenty of practice on my enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. Let's go back and look at the text. Because he tells us the prescription for doing it. And pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. How do you love an enemy? You pray for them. And I love what, that he says those who persecute you. Those who persecute you because of your righteousness, the good things that you do, the things that you believe, and for your faith. You know as well as I do that if you were being interviewed by uh, some news reporter and if they said to you, do you believe that homosexuality is wrong? And you said, well, yeah, I do. And they said, well, then you must hate gays. And, you, and if you said, no, no, I don't. I, I, I love them. I, I love all those that God loves. I, but I think it's right. It wouldn't matter. You would still be hated for something that you believe in, even while you're willing to extend love. And we don't even get to use that as an excuse to hate. Love those who persecute you. <laughs> 
Love those who you could look at and say, that's morally wrong, and therefore, if they hate me, I get to hate them back. No. You pray for them. You pray that God would allow them to see what they don't see. You, you pray that God would open up their hearts, that their lives might be opened up, and they might dwell on the richness of his grace and of his glory and of his power. You show justice to them. Look what we read. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If God is willing to treat our enemies and even his enemies that way, how much more should we be that we show justice, we do what's right, even when the other person is wrong, even when the other person would use it against us, we never withhold justice from anyone because it's ungodly. And people who love God have to love their enemies and can never withhold justice. When you look at the Old Testament, one of the things that God hates over and over again is injustice. He hates scales that are corrupted and, and are made to rip people off. He, he hates it when people oppress widows and orphans and those who are easy to knock off. He hates it when, when people try to cheat uh, their families out of inheritances. God hates all kinds of injustice. And so we are to show justice even to our enemies. How do you love them? You pray for them. You always render justice. You bless them. If you go back to the text, Andreas, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? What he's saying is, you're to love them and bless them as you've been blessed. Because even the pagans just reward those who reward others. We're to be instruments of blessing. Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? And, and, and it's that word greet that also holds for the word blessing. We're supposed to do more than anyone else would do for our enemies. We're supposed to go out of our way to to give. Now, Jesus said this. He said, don't cast your pearls before swine and don't feed what's sacred to dogs. I have those memorized. I like those ones. I like them much better than love your enemies. I like them much better than turn the other cheek. They just come in so handy. Don't feed what's sacred to dogs. Don't cast your pearls before swine. What was Jesus saying? Yeah, Jesus doesn't call you to be a doormat. He doesn't call you to be hurt and beaten and abused just because you're masochistic. He calls you to love. Love means showing justice, it means praying, it means blessing, it means trying to do whatever you can do. It isn't absent of boundaries, but isn't just concerned with boundaries out of fear of being hurt. When God says love your enemies, 
it seems so unnatural and so unhealthy and so unproductive. But it also seems so God, doesn't it? I mean, what is it that tracks us to God? Is he doesn't call for holy jihads. He doesn't give us permission to engage in behaviors that will hurt us. He calls us to discipline ourselves and to give ourselves. I want to close with just a little passage that comes from um, C.S. Lewis in his screw tape letters. Um, how many of you have read that, by the way? Yeah, if you haven't read it, you've got to read it. Um, the screw tapes, t- tape letters is written from the perspective of Satan going out and, and basically preparing his minions to wreak havoc within the body of Christ. Um, and so in this letter, it is a letter from Harshwood to Twist Tape. Listen to what we read. I have read the notices that you are about to graduate and begin your work on earth. Glad to hear that, you were tra- that your training went well. I see that you will be graduated with honors. Splendid. Apply all of your knowledge to the task at hand. For the enemy, the Prince of Peace, God of love, is a resourceful enemy. Just when you think you have him in your grasp, or one of his people, he pulls a trick, and lo and behold, you stand empty. Your loss, you, 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 lo- you lost your soul for the fires of hell. I would give to you one piece of advice, one bit of wisdom as you begin your tour of duty in the enemy's camp. Throughout my tour of duty, I have learned one thing about these humans, which I feel can be so very useful for you. Humans usually have a very high regard for themselves. They think they are pretty good. They can see the faults and sins and evil in another, but they see only the good in themselves. My advice to you, my dear Harshwood, is to encourage that thinking. Encourage it for all it's worth. The chief antagonizer, that Christ fellow, wants the humans to see their own sins, but Harshwood, blind their eyes, their hearts, their souls, to, the rev- to that revelation. Let them think only of the good in themselves. And you, my dear friend Harshwood, will meet your quota of human beings who will spend the rest of their lives with our master, the Lord of the heat and fire, Master Satan. Let them see that when repentance is called for, it is not them who needs to repent. Let them see over and over again that they are really better than the guy next to them in the pew. When the pastor reads about John the Baptist, let them fall asleep, turn to other thoughts, so they will not realize that it is them John is talking to. Let them see that they are indeed really pretty people. No need for repentance, no need for forgiveness, and then you will have them. You will have them because they will see that they do not really need that Christ fellow, and they really need is just themselves then they will be ours. For you see, my dear Harshwood, when these humans see themselves as great, then they are filled with self-pride and they don't need that Jesus fellow. This is how it will begin. They, you will have them in your claws. Good luck on your tour of duty. My heart goes out to you as you use every trick, every scheme, every evil desire, every good intention, every proud thought to win souls for our side. Sign your admiring friend, Twist Tape. Yeah, even the other side understands the power of loving your enemy. Even the other side understands how it goes against our nature because 
we're only looking for love, only expecting it, only getting hurt and disappointed and embittered when we don't get it, only cutting more cloth for more enemies than for friends. And yet Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies. Let me finish with this. This is by John Maxwell. It's called Do It Anyways. People are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Love them anyways. If you do good, people accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Do good anyways. If you are successful, you will win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyways. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyways. The biggest people with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest people with the smallest minds. Think big anyways. People favor underdogs, but will follow only top dogs. Fight for an underdog anyways. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyways. People that really need help often attack you if you help them. Help them anyways. Give the world the best you've got, and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give your best anyways. Why? Because you love your enemies. And when you love your enemies, you can do all of that and more. And what you will become will be the image of Christ on this world. Let's pray.